Good evening. It's good to see this number out. We've got a, a few joining us that wouldn't normally be joining us just because of spring break and the small classes downstairs. So good to have uh, them with us. All right, so we're going to finish up uh, lesson four, questions four and five, and try not to spend too much time on them so we can get into lesson five on discipline. Uh, but we'll just jump right to question five. So what are specific things we can do to be proactive in our family relationships to help avoid issues and conflicts that lead to failing marriages? And so that's kind of been the theme uh, that we've studied uh, with this lesson is just uh, different things that uh, can, can cause our marriages to fail, uh, conflicts that can happen within our marriages and not even just with our marriages but just within our family relationships in general. So we've kind of looked at the, the negative aspect of it, but just thinking of being proactive, um, what are some things that, uh, that we can do to make sure that we grow unfailing marriages? Ms. Shirley? Well, I put there are children up in the marcher of the Lord. Okay. And then I put practice the fruit of the Spirit. And I put uh, wives be submissive to their husband and the husband love their wife. Okay, so all very good. Um, the last one there, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the roles, and I think that is, if you're going to be proactive in making sure that your marriages don't fail, make sure that each spouse is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and so that's, uh, that's definitely a, a key aspect of it. And then, yeah, the, the fruit of the Spirit, that's something that if you are abiding by those, then most of your relationships in life are going to, to, to grow and uh, be fruitful. So that's a good one. Ken? Uh, I wrote down a few things. Uh, I think incorporating regular Bible study is important uh, in a family. Uh, also, dating and marrying a Christian. I kind of looked at this as a, one who was approaching marriage and uh, in a way that would could hopefully avoid a lot of these conflicts that would occur <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so I said date and marry a Christian. Get to know a person and his or her family before marriage. I think a lot of times maybe we get to know the person but we don't get to know their family and sometimes family can have a lot of influence on how a person thinks. Um, yeah. Obviously. And then I said realize that marriage is for life. All good ones. We, we talked about the new relationships that uh, come, uh, we talked about that last week, uh, with a marriage um, and the importance of recognizing that, yeah, your in-laws are going to have an effect on you. They're definitely going to have an effect on your children. Um, and so you're not just marrying the person, you are marrying their family. Um, and I think that uh, you're right. Sometimes we may not know, know their family, and I think in all honesty, sometimes we don't necessarily even know the person that we're marrying because we kind of rush through things and don't spend enough time actually getting uh, to know them. So. Uh, that's a good thing. Be proactive in making sure that you do know uh, your spouse and know their family. All right, what else? JJ? Reference to avoiding issues and conflicts. I think you have to be attentive. There's so much uh, instruction to individual Christians to be watchful about things around them. And stuff, stuff creeps in them. You know, and, and people, you know, they'll say we drifted apart. Well, that's a process over time. You know, tide is not flash flood, right? So I think you have to be attentive. Yeah. Yeah, you got uh, you got to be watchful and, and make sure that you're uh, watching for little things that could be potential issues. And we talked about this last week too. That first comes with being watchful for yourself, because if there's ever a problem, we need to look in the mirror first before you start pointing fingers at, at your spouse. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a, a good one. Be watchful. Others. Brother Bill? Uh, communicate what you're seeing when you're being watchful. And you brought that out before how communication is so important. But it needs to be regular and specific to, to what's going on in your relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we've, we've nailed that down where communication is just one of the key things. And it, it's in any relationship, but especially between a husband and a wife, uh, you're not going to have a, a great relationship if you're not communicating. And that's not just about things that are going well, but when things aren't going well and, and when there are issues. We talked about the specific 
uh, hypothetical that aren't so hypothetical situations that we talked about last week. Um, and part of that is you've got to be able to communicate. And sometimes it's difficult when, you're, when you don't feel like your spouse is, is doing what God has asked them to do and living up to their role. And you've got to sit down and have that, uh, that conversation. That's not easy, but uh, communication is such a key aspect of it. And, and catching things like that on the front end. And the sooner you catch them and you don't let them get out of control, um, that's definitely part of being proactive in, in making our marriages last. Others? Sam? If you end up having conflicts, like I would say it's like smaller conflicts with <laughs> your, your partner, um, and you resolve those issues, you know, don't bring them back up, and especially don't go to maybe like your family members and complain about them to your family because you want them to like your partner as well, and you want her family to like you, so yeah, hope it's the same. Yeah, and we talked about that in a um, uh, previous lesson. I mean, that's important. Uh, I think one of the things that we read from a point from somebody was think of your husband as the greatest man alive or something. I don't know exactly how it was worded. And, okay, maybe not necessarily uh, to that degree, but don't go around talking bad about them, and especially to your, your in-laws. Um, definitely. Norm? Uh, don't let the children be a wedge between the husband and the wife. Don't let the children be what? A wedge between the husband and the wife. I didn't hear a witch. Yeah. She said, don't the children be a witch. Okay. Yeah. A witch. With biblical examples, uh, the, the largest yeah. problems in the marriages were associated with that uh, bad relationship structure that they had been allowed to, to keep in. Don't let them be a witch. And also uh, recognize that the marriage relationship trumps the uh, parent to child relationship. And so your children are not more important than your spouse. Uh, and that's um, from the time they're conceived until the time they leave your house. And even after they leave your house, so that's a, another one. So I think one of the key, th did I say another hand? So one of the key things with any of uh, these family relationships is, number one, we've got we to gotta continue to trust God in our relationship and put our faith in Him. Uh, so as uh, Sister Shirley said, we've got to trust God in our roles. And we can't, you know, our wisdom is not greater than God's wisdom, and this is what he has uh, designed for us. We've got to trust God in our money uh, and our finances and just make sure that we put our trust in him. Um, we talked about uh, last week some of the issues when the husband or the wife is working too much and you're not spending a whole lot of time. So if you're going to be proactive and you're going to make a marriage last, you've got to spend time together. Uh, make sure that you've got uh, the commitment at home uh, more than you do a commitment to a job. Um, and then um, one of the things that, uh, that I had read is in just trying to, to grow your marriage is to celebrate your differences. And men and women are not alike, all right? We've already established that, and that's okay. God created uh, us to be compatible with one another, and so we should celebrate the fact that we're not the same and use that to, to work together. Um, and it, this is just like any other relationship. It's going to take uh, some nurturing, and we'll talk about that in the, the next lesson, but that's something that's, that's very important. Anything else on question five? Yes, Ms. Sue? I, I don't know if you covered this or not, but don't involve your parents in your problems. You know, if, if you run home to mom and tell her because you know she's going to be on your side or whatever, you know, and he said this to me and he did this and all this stuff, well, she's going to take your side, but then when you make up, you're fine. But she might, she was always going to remember those terrible things that he did, you know, so. Yeah, that's probably not going to be a good argument if you're talking to your spouse and you tell them, well, my mama said. <laughs> probably ain't going to go over so well. All right, uh, number six, listen, explain Bible examples of conflict resolution that can help us in our marriage and family relationships. And the, the Bible is full of conflict and... Uh, full of conflict resolution, too. So what are some examples that you came away with that might be able to, to help us? Ken? I thought of Abraham and Lot when they were trying to decide where they were going to live and uh, how Abraham was willing to yield to Lot. 
So from that, I think it's, it's a good idea to be have a person who's willing to yield in an argument. Yeah, yeah, that's one that I had thought of. And I think that's a great example. Um, there's a lot of wisdom that is shown there from Abraham's uh, perspective. I think it's a, a combination of being willing to yield and also a lack of selfishness, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, we've talked about as the number one killer of uh, marriages. And so recognizing that this might not be the best you know, of the land, but um, it's better to, to yield in that situation. So, yeah, that's a good one. Others? Bonnie? Jesus and Judas at the last Passover, where there's obviously a conflict there between the two of them. And Jesus isn't afraid to address it. He acknowledges what's fixing to happen. Um, he addresses it calmly. He gives him a chance. There's a chance where he could repent and not do what he's about to do. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there between any, you know, with any conflict you have with anyone where you, you don't ignore it. You have to address the problem. But then also give them a chance to absorb everything that you just said and give them a chance to repent or change or say something back, whatever, you know, but don't ignore it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was a good one. Uh, that's one that I had. That, I mean, I think that the fact that he just didn't ignore it and he did deal with it uh, as calmly as he did and did give him that opportunity to, to change, and Judas could have. I mean, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't predetermined that he was going to, to do that, and his mind wasn't made up. He made up his own mind, so um, that's a good one. Others? JJ, we mentioned it under a different subject, but uh, you know Paul constantly tells people, <coughs> "Suffer the loss, take the hit." I think if you want to look at it in a family context, Jesus sort of came to reconcile man with God, which would be the ultimate conflict resolution. It's exactly what he did was take the hit, literally, yeah, and eternally, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, just going along with that, thinking about uh, Jesus uh, and also being wronged, uh, kind of like what Ken was talking about. So Jesus is the perfect example of, he took all of this uh, torture and beatings, verbal and physical, uh, and he was mocked, uh, all of these things, and yet he's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So you've got to have a forgiving attitude. And don't anybody get me wrong. I'm not saying that because I said he was uh, abused physically. We already talked about that last week. I'm not saying if you're abused physically that you should just uh, say forgive, forgive them. Uh, if they repent, yes. But don't want anybody to misunderstand uh, the connection there. All right, others? Ken? I thought of Barnabas and, uh, and Paul, Paul and Barnabas over John Mark when they uh, had the conflict about him. Yeah. And then they set, parted ways and you know went opposite directions. But sometimes that might be what has to be done, at least for a time, until you can resolve matters, come back together and resolve matters. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> that's another one that I thought of, and I think that that's a, a good um, example, because there are going to be times, um, even in our uh, marriages, that we may have a sharp disagreement. And it might be best, yeah, to, okay, let's, let's just do our separate things for a short time, and then we're going to come back together, and we're going to be fine, and we're going to be able to, to communicate. But uh, you've got to, to recognize uh, when those times are, when you have those sharp disagreements and contentions, um, and knowing that in order to be able to work through them uh, in a Christ-like manner, maybe we need to just stop and, and stop the discussion at that point. Uh, with Sue and I, sometimes we'll have a conflict on, over something, and I'll go into another room, and we'll start texting, and we work things out on text. <laughs> that sometimes works when you're not face to face, you know. Yeah. So. Other examples. Norm. Uh, Abigail and her idiot husband. <laughs> she, she was. She was a. <coughs> or how uh, a godly woman uh, should act. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's really a lot of them in the, the Old Testament. Um, there's a lot of conflict, and oftentimes the, con the conflict resolution is they just 
separate. Uh, you've got Isaac and Ishmael uh, with the Ishmaelites. You've got Joseph, obviously, and his brothers. Uh, you've got Saul and David. You've got Jacob and Esau that uh, we studied recently, Jacob and Laban. Uh, you've got Philemon and Onesimus. Um, and then if you would turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And let's just read verses 2 through 9 of Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and we'll start over here with Sam and then work our way back. Just take yeah. a verse. <coughs> <coughs> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow labor, laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So there is, uh, seems to be some form of conflict between Yodia and uh, Sanctity there in, in uh, verse 2, and he's imploring them to be of the same mind, and so this isn't something that I come up with, but I, I found it and I thought this is pretty good. So if you're going to, to resolve conflict, um, so the, the following passages here underneath verse 2. So it says, number one, you're going to rejoice in the Lord always. So you're going to remember who the Lord is. Rejoice in the Lord from verse 4. Number two, you're going to let your reasonableness be known to everyone. So make sure that you're reasonable in, in all of your dealings, especially if you're having a conflict. Uh, the latter part of verse 5, remember that the Lord is at hand. And so we can't just separate ourselves from the Lord and act like, well, we're not going to act like a Christian in this situation or in this, this moment. And then verse 6, don't be anxious about the conflict, but ask God to resolve it. So prayer, we've talked about that many times. That should be a, a staple of, of any relationship. And just because you're having conflict doesn't mean that you now do away with that. And then from verse 7, guard your heart and mind with the peace of God, even when it does not make sense to do so. Uh, so even in conflict, uh, try to find the peace of, in, in God. And then verse 8, find something, anything praiseworthy to focus on in your antagonist. And I thought that's a good one because we're looking for the negative. We're looking for the bad things. And uh, when we really should tell our minds, how about we focus on the good things and all the good uh, that this person is doing for us. Um, and then in verse 9, find good role models and continue practicing these things. So I thought that was uh, pretty good whenever we're trying to resolve conflict. All right, anything else on lesson 4 before we move into lesson 5? Todd? Maybe you can get on that list, but you see Paul um, having very high expectations of the other person, uh, saying, I, I have full, I think in his letter to Philemon, it's, you know, I have confidence that you're going to do this. And so he's, in our relationships, we should have the same confidence. Sometimes we fall into uh, the trap of tr acting like you always do this, you're always this way. And that's not true, first of all. Nobody's ever always a certain way. But um, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're going to address this thing, and we have got full confidence in them. Yeah, and just uh, like I said, just the way that Paul—it's almost like he's setting him up for success. When oftentimes we're setting somebody up for failure, uh, just because we think so lowly of them. And Paul, just in his 
uh, his uh, perceived confidence in them is, is setting them up. Uh, he knows that they'll be successful in this relationship. I know that you can do this. So, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, Sam? Did you already mention Joshua 22? Did you say that as an example? Joshua 22? Yeah, um, sorry. When he's like the Reubenites and whoever was supposed to, who was to claim their part of the land um, on the, the other side, um, they ended up building that altar. And all the other Israelites thought that they were building an altar to another god. So, like, there's that conflict there. They were planning to go to war with them. But it's like they had expectations for how, you know, these tribes were supposed to act. And they confronted them and, like, I guess, met first, accusing them, saying, this is what it looks like. Then they defended themselves. And, like, the conflict was resolved peacefully, which is great. But uh, I think, you know, the... The Israelites who had uh, expectations for these people, and then these people defending themselves and obviously not being wrong, it seems kind of weird, but, but they didn't do anything sinful. Like that peaceful resolution was a good thing. So I yeah. think, like, knowing that it is a good thing to call out someone if they're doing something wrong, but also being willing to hear them and <laughs> Not just say, look, I know you're wrong, because that's pretty pessimistic and rude and mean. So that's yeah. a good way to make the conflict resolve peacefully. Yeah. And uh, a good thing, too, just when you're saying that, uh, sometimes um, unexplained expectations can cause problems within a relationship where you've got this expectation of your spouse that they don't know that, that you have this expectation. Um, and so uh, sometimes we have to be clear that, that can be in a job setting too where the boss really isn't, he's got these expectations of the employees and they have no idea what the expectations are. So, all right, let's uh, pick up with lesson five. So lesson five um, is really focus on discipline uh, in regards to parenting. So we're kind of shifting gears. We've spent uh, most of our class so far, I mean, talking about the family relationships, but mostly really the the husband and the wife relationship. So now we're kind of rolling into more the, the role of a parent. And discipline is such a huge thing. Um, and it's such a, such a big thing uh, that is talked about in our society. And uh, we'll talk about that more in the, the last question. But this is a, this is a big deal when it, it uh, comes to parenting. So question number one, how does Proverbs 22.6 sum up the role of parents? And what thoughts about children and training do we learn from Proverbs 22, verse 6? So Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So what we learn from that? Norm? The parent's job is to do the training. Okay. Ch child will not train themselves. Well, they will train themselves to do something eventually. <laughs> All right. Drew? Uh, it's the parent's goal, the end goal, to make your child produ productive, make them holy, make them um, independent. That should be your goal through the whole process. And you don't really want to think about that when they're little because, you know, they're little and innocent and they need you and all those things. But that's, that's the end goal always. Yeah. Yeah. It is something that you have to, to be reminded of, especially when you are... Uh, a young parent because your child relies on you for everything because so they're entirely dependent but yet we're trying to grow them to be uh, independent um, of course continuing to be dependent upon the Lord and so yeah that's something that it starts from the very beginning what else from, from the when you, you know start very very young to train them on the things you know, at each level that they need, and if you do that, then it's easier for them to be receptive or to understand or to know you say what you mean, you mean what you say, and um, it just saves it, you know, if you're not trying to backtrack. Um, so anyway, and, and consist consistency is key, you know, from this verse, it's like train them diligently, you know, you're, you're supposed to be consistent um, it's hard work, it's daily, it's just, it's non-stop, but again, like Drew said, you know, our end goal is to raise um, faithful Christian adults that 
will go out into the world and be that light. And that starts with you. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, I've heard people say that they don't believe this verse is true because they say, you know, I worked hard to train my child in the way it should go. And when he got old enough to leave the house, he left it. He, you know, he went, he fell away or whatever. <clears throat> so I'd be interested in hearing what people have to say because this verse sounds like an absolute. It says, when he is old, he will not depart from it. So how does that work? You know? So what do we know about the Proverbs in general? General truth, not to be taken as absolute. Sometimes you say anything directly contradict because the opposites are both generally true. Yeah. So this is just proverbial wisdom, um, and I would call it as this is the rule, and the rule states that this is true. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be an exception to the rule. Um, and so we can't uh, be swayed away from doing uh, what we know is the wisest thing to do because of a case where, well, we, we did everything that we could. And, and that's, uh, that's kind of subjective, too. Did you really? I um, mean, did you train them up in the way that they should go? Because to me, this passage teaches us three very clear things. And the first thing is that there is a way that children ought to go. So that's, we, know that, we know that there's a way that children ought to go. And two, we know that training is necessary in order for them to go in the way that they should go. So there is a way, and then there's training that's going to get them uh, to go that way. And then it also teaches us that the most lasting impressions upon man are the trainings that they received when they're young. All right, so this is happening when the child is young because it says even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So this has got to happen when, uh, when they're young. And so the, the first question would be, all right, are they receiving the training necessary and teaching them the way that they ought to go? And uh, again, I'm not saying that if you did everything perfectly that your children are going to turn out perfectly, but um, wisdom states that this is the way that, that we should train our children. Sam? I guess I read training up a child. It reminds me, uh, for some reason, of uh, Jesus' parable of the, the soils, the different soils and the seeds that are uh, placed within it, where only the seed that is able to take root um, and be strong is the one that grows and remains and doesn't wither. Uh, if you give your, your child the opportunity to... Um, like if, you, if you train them up the way that you maybe it makes me think of like I don't know like a tomato plant like having it maybe like wind a vine around where you want it to go you, you're training it up to go in that direction it'll be deeply rooted and it'll be more difficult for it to be removed so I mean even though if you wanted to you could still probably pull it up it's it's harder for that to happen and I think while your child is is uh, receptive to new information and it's constantly, you know, in that stage where they're learning. I know that I was like that when I was younger. Um, it's, it's generally a good thing to teach them good things because they will hold on to those things and be rooted within them. Okay. So what does, what does training take? What does that require on our part? Time? Effort. Effort. <laughs> yeah. There's work, okay. And uh, it's not easy. Uh, and so this is, this is part of, uh, you know, having a family and having these conversations even as parents um, or even just as a married couple before, uh, you, you know, you decide to even have children. You've you got to recognize there's a huge responsibility and there's a, a huge task at hand uh, when you have these children. And... The responsibility, again, it's on you to do the training, and so you've got to put the work in, you've got to put the time in, you've got to put the effort in to make sure that you are directing them in the way that they should go. All right, anything else on number one? Norm? In, in general, the, uh, I mean, this gives us a, another clue as to how God designed the system. This is the way the system was designed. Anything you deviate from that, you're going to be going against the system. That God created, so it's not going to have the optimum results. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that 
uh, I have read more than anything in studying for this lesson is, I'm telling you, we just as a, as a human race think that we're so much smarter than God. And it's like we question everything. Uh, and, and I've read so many questions that have been sent uh, even on Christian posts and, and sent to Christian preachers. And uh, it's like they're asking questions that uh, they know contradict what God says, but yet they're acting like, well, but because of my situation, uh, and we talked about that in one of the, the lessons about situational ethics, and it happens when, with marriages, and it happens with raising our kids. It's like, well, but you don't really know what it's like to have my kid. No, God knows. <laughs> and we have to, to make sure that we follow uh, his wisdom. All right, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6, and let's look at verses 1 through 4. And look at some of these terms here. So Ephesians 6, let's read 1 through 4. I think we're ready for Miss Sue, and then we'll just work our way back with one verse apiece. Okay, so it's 6, 1 through 4. Okay. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor well, your father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise. Then it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Uh, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right, so Norm, you've got the New American Standard, right? Yep. So somebody's got a different translation on verse 4. Fathers, do not exas exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay. So it swaps training and discipline there. Uh, what translation you got, Michael? NIV. NIV. Somebody else? And you, brethren, you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up into training and admonition of the Lord. All right, so it swaps admonition and instruction there. Somebody got the King James? Nurture and admonition, and then the, I don't remember what the English standard. So discipline. discipline and instruction, so same as the New American Standard. So, so these words that I've got here, discipline, nurture, uh, chastening, admonition, are all uh, kind of related but what does, uh, how would you define discipline? I mean, I know how I thought I would define it when I was a kid, and that means whipping. That's what I always thought when I was growing up. Admonishing. Admonishing. Okay. Training. All right. Training and instructing. Uh, call to soundness of mind. Call to soundness of mind. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a KJV definition. <laughs> Marissa? Discipline is like a system of beliefs, so we're trying to give our children the discipline or the understanding of what God wants. Yeah. So instruction, actions. All right. So if you just look it up in Webster's, it's, uh, the first definition is training that develops self-control or character. And then two, punishment inflicted by way of correction and training. So there's kind of a dual meaning there. Uh, so it's this training and this instruction. Um, and it's also this, this um, correction. And so that kind of gets into the next question where you've got instructive and corrective, uh, but they're both discipline. If you look it up in Thayer's, it's the whole training and education of children which relates to the cultivation of mind and morals and employs for this purpose now commands and admonitions now reproof and punishment so it's the whole concept of training and educating uh, and molding our children uh, again as Proverbs 22 verse 6 in the way that they should go and so um, it's, it's an all encompassing thing anything else on discipline all right, what about nurture? How would you define nurture? Oh, really? Okay. It's instructing. Instructing. Marissa? Nurture brings with a connotation of love. It's giving what's required for growth as you are loving. Something. Okay. So is this, this idea of love? Yeah. And to care for and to encourage the development of. Okay. So <clears throat> what's typically involved with the development of uh, 
a child? From yeah, from the physical standpoint, what's required? Okay, yeah. So when I think of nurture, I think of nourishment, um, and so that's that's part of it. We are promoting good health and strength uh, within our children. And of course, this is talking about spiritually, but obviously, obviously, physically, there it's our responsibility to do that as well. But I, I think that that kind of goes along with this idea of nourishment. Norm acquainting them with a uh, structure, uh, in this case a family structure, uh, and, and the nurturing part, I think of a pack of animals and stuff, and, and there's nurturing going on there, and they learn uh, you know, who the mother is, and the, and the pack order, and all that, and so you're, 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 you're in a loving way, in a caressing way, you are uh, helping them to identify the environment that they're growing up in. Yeah. All right, Todd? I think of the phrase nature versus nurture. Sometimes we debate whether or not that was in, innate in a person. But, you know, the proverb that says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. The nature of every child is a fool. The, the simple in the proverbs definition doesn't, doesn't have any wisdom at all. And so the nurture is to instill some wisdom into that fool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of it is the nurturing has to beat some of the nature out of the child. You can't let nature take over. We've got to let nurture take over. Uh, all right, chastening. How would you define chastening? <clears throat> this was always a difficult one for me growing up, too, because I uh, used to. I thought I knew how to write poems, so I'd always try to find words that rhyme. I was like, there's nothing that rhymes with Jason. And then I come up with Jason, and I'm like, oh, that's not a good one. <laughs> I don't want that synonymous with Jason. So. <laughs> yeah. so how would you define chasing? Correction. Or discipline. Okay. Rebuke. Rebuke. Okay. Drew? Setting boundaries. Setting boundaries. Correction. Yeah, so the... There is this idea of, um, of rebuke and also physical discipline or physical punishment. So the verb of the word also means it, to chastise with blows, to scourge. Um, and yeah, I know you hear that and I think, uh, and we'll read some of those Proverbs passages and it probably makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable and I think part of it is because of the society we are in now of gentle parenting, but uh, that's the verb meaning to, to chastise with blows and to scourge. And so, but again, there's this idea of correction because there is a way in which they should go. Uh, and so sometimes that needs uh, correcting. Yeah, it's like a correction that leads to a humbling. So it's, you know, sometimes when you think of chasing, like someone gets chastened and they kind of have their head down, like, it's, you know, especially like if you're getting on to your kids um, about something serious that maybe they know they shouldn't have done. They, they then know and they, they feel like almost embarrassed and humbled. Um, you know, I would say all of our kids don't want to disappoint, you know, their parents. And that's almost like it's hurtful. You don't want to beat that nature out of a child. No. You want them to always have that mindset. But uh, I've talked many a times about some of my family members, and they didn't necessarily have that uh, that attitude. All right. What about admonition? How would you define admonition? Encourage one or if necessary to reprove. Okay. So you've got... Ms. Shirley said the training by word, so either by encouragement or, if necessary, by reproof. How do we admonish one another? Well, it's like a constructive criticism. A gentle, friendly kind of admonition is you should first go at it from a, a gentle perspective. 
Okay. When, so, when I looked it up online, I, I thought it was interesting that it said the Bible definition was moral correction through verbal confrontation motivated by genuine love. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. All right, and the last one there. What does of the Lord say about training? So bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord or the discipline and training of the Lord based on his word mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. okay there's a way there's one way to bring them up all right yeah I think of uh, of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and how important it is to to talk of the Lord uh, so often um, So yeah, that one uh, hopefully should go without saying that if we're going to, to give them the proper discipline, the pro proper training, the proper instruction that it is going to be of the Lord or according to, according to the Lord. All right, question number three. What's the difference between instructive discipline and corrective discipline? And what are some examples of both? So what's the difference in the two? Ken? I would say that instructive is proactive if you know what I mean, before a problem exists, and then correct it would be correcting a problem after it, after it exists. Okay. Ms. Shirley? Well, I thought instructor would be talking to a child and letting him know what you expect and what, what it maybe he had done. And then I put corrective this discipline spanking <coughs> necessary. Okay. True. Or what I said earlier, setting boundaries and then when they're violated, taking corrective actions. Okay. So if, if you set the boundaries, um, what are you trying to accomplish with that? It could be protection, it could be on Okay. Expectations. Yeah. Behavior. Yes. Uh, so you, you're setting the expectation. So I would say that, that uh, instructive discipline is more preventative. All right. We're, we're telling you this is the way that you should go. Okay, and then when you don't go the way that you should go, although I have instructed you in the way that you should go, trying to be proactive and preventative, n now we've got to be corrective. All right, you were told, uh, and this is the way that you are going to go, and so now we've got to correct it. All right, so with corrective, it's more of a, a penalizing or a, a correction, and it's uh, going to have a punishment, uh, should have a punishment associated with it. Sam? The instruction is to protect your protect whoever you're, you're teaching from like the real consequences. Like your consequences are kind of I don't want to say artificial, but you know they're not as serious as they can be if they go out in the real world and do something terrible. And it reminds me of Solomon teaching from the Proverbs and from Ecclesiastes. You know, he had his experience and he had his sins, but here here's why you should do it and avoid taking the long way to to truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ultimately, you're trying to prevent it from going ahead. Long term goal. All right, so Miss Shirley was the first one to bring up spanking. We'll talk about it next week.